Hi, this is Professor Jen Meng Chan at California State University, Long Beach. In this video lesson today, we'll develop intuitions with fractions. In particular, we'll focus on developing intuitions to estimate the sizes of fractions and comparing sizes of fractions. We will do these without using calculators, because as soon as you go to calculator, your brain shuts down and you're not learning how to make sense, reason, explain and look for patterns, which are the fundamental abilities that make us different than, say, robots or other animals on the planet. We will start by going over some basic concepts about fractions. The first concept is that when you're comparing two numbers, the number that is further to the right on the number line is always greater. You can visualize this like going to a doctor's office, except this time you're going to a mathematician's office. So then the numbers to the right are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the number to the right is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And we denote their relationships using these pointing symbols. For example, I write negative 1 less than 1 because negative 1 is to the left of 1 on the real number line. The symbol less than or greater than always points out or opens out to the number that is greater. If I wanted to write 5 is greater than 4, I can choose to write 5 and have the sign opens up to 5, or I can write as a 4 and have the sign opens up to 5 on the right. It's completely up to you how you wanted to denote that relationship. Concept number 2. When we have a fraction that is denoted as n over d, where n represents the numerator and d represents the denominator, recall that the denominator of a fraction gives size of a part. So a bigger n gives a bigger fraction. For example, the fraction 4 over 5 and the fraction 3 over 5 both have the same denominator 5, but the fraction 4 over 5 has a bigger n, so 4 fifths is greater than 3 fifths. You can also visualize this on the number line. The size of the fraction in this question is fifth. That means I would divide up the interval between 0 and 1 into 5 equal parts, where each part is a fifth. Then the fraction 3 over 5 means that I'm taking 3 parts of each size 1 fifth, and 4 over 5 means I'm taking 4 parts of each size 1 over 5. So then it's clear that 4 parts is greater than 3 parts. And it's also clear that 3 fifth is to the left of 4 fifth on the number line. So it's very convenient to compare fractions when they both have the same sizes, and the fraction with the bigger part is the bigger fraction. Constant number 3 is very similar to constant number 2. In any fraction, n over d, where n represents the numerator of a fraction and d represents the denominator of that fraction, we know that the numerator of the fraction gives the number of parts, so a bigger denominator gives a smaller size, hence giving an overall smaller fraction. And I just want to briefly mention why this is true. Now remember, d represents how many parts makes whole. So if you have, for example, four people sharing a pot of money, then each person gets a quarter of it. But if you have five people sharing the same pot of money, each person gets less amount than if you were to share amount four people. So the bigger the denominator, the smaller the fraction. So for constant number three here, let me give you an example. If you want to compare the fraction five over four, with the fraction 5 over 6. Both fractions have the same numerator, so that means there are 5 parts total, but the fraction 5 over 4 is saying that I cut up the 5 parts but share that amount 4 people, versus the fraction 5 over 6 takes 5 parts and shared amount 6 people, then of course, if you have to share it with more people, then each person is going to get less. The fraction 5 over 4 is greater than 5 over 6. Constant number 4 says that fractions can be expressed in many ways via this notion of equivalent fractions. So we want to choose the representation that allows us to use the previous concept easily. For example, if I want to compare the fraction 3 over 5 with the fraction 8 over 15, it's not so easy to compare the sizes of those two fractions straight up because nothing is really the same. So what we could do is either make the numerator the same or the denominator the same. And I see that if I were to multiply the fraction 3 over 5 by a factor of 1, which is 3 over 3, then I can convert that fraction into a representation having 15 as the denominator. So we have 9 over 15. Now you see this is very easy to compare to the fraction 8 over 15 because both fractions share the same denominator. Of course, 9 parts is more than 8 parts, therefore 9 fifteenths is greater than 8 fifteenths, which means that the fraction 3 over 5 is greater than 8 over 15. The last concept we'll talk about in this video is to use familiar numbers as benchmarks in comparing fractions. We might have a hard time knowing where 12 over 25 is on the number line, but it should be fairly straightforward to find one half on the number line. So the number that you're familiar with is what we call the benchmark. 
For example, if I want to compare 3 fourths and 2 fifths, I can use 1 half as a benchmark. In leveraging the concept of equivalent fractions, I can, and I can write 1 half as the appropriate representation depending on the context. So in this case, I can think of 1 half as 2 fourths. And notice the fact that 3 over 4 has more parts than 2 over 4 tells me that 3 quarters is greater than 1 half. On the other hand, I can write 1 half as 2.5 over 5, which is greater than 2 over 5, because certainly 2.5 has more parts than 2. So now you have 3 quarters, which is greater than 1 half, and 2 fifths, which is less than 1 half. It should be fairly obvious that 3 quarters is greater than 2 fifths. With these concepts, let's practice answer different types of questions regarding fractions. Let's start with this first example. Which is closer to 1 on the real number line? 5 sixth or 6 fifth? Here you want to pause the video and then take a moment to think about this and come back for answer. To answer this question, first notice that both fractions are one part away from 1. In particular, the fraction 5 over 6 is one part less than 1, and then the fraction 6 over 5 is one part bigger than 1. But although they're both one part away from one, the sizes of their parts are different. You can imagine the sizes of a part is like a stride size. If you and your friend are both one step away from one, but you have a smaller stride size, then you're actually closer to one than your friend is. And then in this case, the fraction one over six has a smaller stride size or a smaller size. Therefore, the fraction five over six is actually closer to one than the fraction six over five. You can also visualize this on the number line. For the fraction 5 over 6, I'm dividing up the interval between 0 and 1 into 6 equal parts. So each part is the strike size, and in this case is 1 over 6. And for 6 over 5, I would take the same interval, but then divide it into 5 equal parts. And starting from 0, I would count off 6 parts. But that will put me on the right hand side of 1. So you'll notice that the strike size of the 1 fifth is greater than the strike size of 1 sixth. That's why 5 sixth is closer to 1 than 6 fifth. Let's look at another example. Which of the following is the smallest fraction? You want to think about what is the best approach to tackle this problem using all of the concepts we've talked about so far. If you're tempted to just grab that calculator, don't. If you do that, then you're just doing the problem for the sake of doing problem. You're not allowing your brain to grow and to think. Once you had a chance to think about this, you can, again, you can do this problem in so many different ways. I'm going to show you how to do this using a benchmark. You can use one half as a benchmark. Then I can write one half in different representations using equivalent fractions. Writing one halves in fifths, it gives me 2.5 over 5. Writing one halves in ninths, I would get 4.5. And writing one halves in thirteenths, it would be 6.5. You're essentially just taking your denominator and divide it by 2. And writing one halves in 40 fourth, that would be 22. Then it should be fairly obvious to see that 3 fifths is greater than 1 half, and 4 ninths is less than 1 half, and 7 thirteenths is greater than 1 half, and 23 over 44 is also greater than 1 half. So the only number that is less than 1 half in this question is 4 over 9, making 4 ninths the smallest fraction in this list. This next one and also the last example is most fun. It really incorporates the concepts of operations as well as fractions in this one single problem. So you want to estimate and label the following numbers on the real number line. You notice that option A uses the addition operation, option B gives you subtraction, option C is a multiplication problem, and option D is a division problem. You want to avoid actually carrying out the calculation that is specified in the choices. Instead, you want to use what you know about the operations to estimate the point on the number line. Now take a moment to think about this question and then come back for answer. To find the point 1 third plus 2 fifth, I will first take my interval between 0 and 1 and divide into 3 equal parts and then take the first part. That gives me the location of 1 third on the number line. And then from that point on, I want to add 2 fifth to it. So right below it on the separate number line, I'm going to help myself to find 2 fifth. But I want to do that from the location of 1 third. So this is my starting point, and I want to count off one unit. Uh, so then if this is one third, another third, I need another third. This would then give me three thirds, which is the amount of one. So then on this interval, I want to divide it into five equal pieces and take two parts. So this is how much two fifths gives from the starting point of one third. So that allows me to locate the result of one third plus two fifths. 
Next, let's look at 2 fifths minus 1 third. We use a similar idea and then divide up the interval between 0 and 1 into 5 equal pieces and take 2 parts. And right below it, I will do another number line to help me see the size as 1 third. And then I'll take away 1 third from 2 fifths. So divide up this interval into three equal pieces, and this is the size of one third. So see, from the point of two fifths, you want to take away this much. This is essentially the difference between those two numbers, that tiny little bit. So the answer for B is right about a point that is very close to zero. Next, let's look at one third times two fifths. I can interpret this as taking a third of two fifths. So I will first find my two fifths, and I'll just take a third of that. As before, you divide up the interval between zero and one into five equal pieces pieces and find two parts, that gives us the location of two fifths. And then I want to take a third of that, which means that whatever is in between zero and two fifths, I want to divide up into three equal pieces and only take one part of that. That gives me the location of C right there in between zero and one fifth. Lastly, let's look at the most fun one, which is one third divided by two fifths. Now remember the de definition of a division is fair share. So we're asking the questions, how many two fifths we can fit into one third? So we start with the size of one third. And we figure out the size of two fifths. Then we ask ourselves, well, how many of size two fifths I can fit into this size of one third? And you'll see that two fifths is actually longer than one third. So that means it must be a fraction of two fifths I can fit into one third. And that fraction is kind of close to one because it's the length of these two are almost the same. So the answer for D ended up being a point that is really close to one. So if you want to order these numbers uh, from the smallest to the largest, it would be B is the smallest, and then C, then A, and eventually D is the largest. So hopefully now you've become more comfortable comparing fractions and seeing the sizes of fractions from the perspective of the definitions of fractions. So some of the key ideas we talked about in this lesson was one, to use familiar numbers as benchmarks to make comparison. Two, convert the fractions into equivalent fractions so that the fractions that you're comparing to have the same denominator or numerator. And three, like the last example showed, don't get scared of using the definitions of the operations in computing things that involve fractions. And number four, don't use calculator for these type of questions because the reasoning is the fundamental aspect of this lesson and reasoning is what makes math fun.